So we're here at Portland Retro Gaming Expo 2018 with John Shampo, uh, developer of games such as the bright lights are killing me, but uh, Lunar Lander, Conquest of Mars, Ladybug, Scramble, Super Cobra Arcade, Mappy, and Wizard of War yep. now. The list keeps going. Yep, the list yeah. just keeps going, and more to come, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your games tend to be ports yes. of arcade games. Um, so what what motivates you to do ports of games rather than original games? Or are you thinking of doing some maybe some original games in the future? Well, I'll answer that first question, James. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I generally do ports because they have a finite ending to them. Um, yeah. And also the challenge. As you, most of the games that I choose to port, most people would think are difficult to do on the 2600, so they're very challenging. So I'm not going to be porting like a game that is fairly straightforward. So things like Mappy or like Scramble, um, even Wizard of War Arcade with the uh, voice over that, are very challenging games to do. So that's, and since I have a template to go go with the port itself, you know, there's a finite end to it, and there's some things are certainly impossible in 2600. Yeah. So there's also some creativity to say, well, how can I still capture the essence of the game within the limits of the 2600, but do it to a point where people say, wow, that's still pretty amazing. So yeah. And I think Wizard of War is your first game that you're kind of redoing because it was originally put out with the 2600 in back in the 80s, 90s. And would be actually the second one. Super Cobra Arcade was the first. So oh, okay. yeah. So Super Cobra Arcade again. Super Cobra Arcade came as a um, extension of S Scramble. So Scramble has never been released in 2600, so the engines are fairly similar. Still took another year to put all the extra stuff in a Super Cobra Arcade, but that's kind of where that came from. So, um, But yeah, Wizard of War was originally released back in the uh, 80s. I did start a version in 2007 that was just all semi-language, about 40% done. Took a few years off, eight or nine. Um, <laughs> And then once I got back into 2600, last year my brother and I were here at the Portland Game Expo. We spent about four hours playing it in the arcade. Yep. And I vowed on that day <laughs> I would have it released, or at least uh, playable by uh, Portland Game Expo of 2018. And, and here we are, so we, uh, we sucked true to that promise. So. Yeah. And, and going back to like porting the games, all of the games that you've done so far are ports of arcade games. Yep. Um, so in the future, are you thinking about doing an original game? Do you have any ideas for um, original games? Actually, I do have one. I, um, it's, it's called Mountain Raider. It was a game that I actually designed in 1982. A good friend of mine, Dennis LaFleur, um, we went to a Catholic school together. Um, and we were intrigued by the Atari when it came out, of course. Um, but that game I actually designed and uh, we sent it to Atari and uh, they rejected it. But they, oh. they gave me a very nice poster. Um, <laughs> they basically said, uh, you know, it's a game that couldn't be done. So of course that will inspire me to do it at some point. <laughs> um, I do have the original designs for that. Um, oh, nice. So I've dug those out. So that's something I've always wanted to do. But um, again, it's the list of games that people want to see on the Atari that purports um, is ever growing. Um, I think you have a few requests yourself. Um, so it's always a balance. You know, you're taking a chance when you go and you release an original game to see if people are actually going to, A, is it going to be fun? You know, that's one thing that when you're porting a game that you already know is fun and you have uh, good memories of, you know that if you can port it fairly close to what it originally was, you're going to have a game that people are going to enjoy. Not necessarily the case if it's an original game. So. But it's not saying I do would never do one, but that would be that. So um, I've also had some ideas for, and we are talking about now this multi-port adapter that we developed. From, um, so I'm, one game, a type of game I've always wanted to do is like an action adventure kind of game. Those have always been my favorite kind of games. Like an RPG. Yeah, yeah. but more like Gauntlet, but not as action oriented. So a game where there's adventure, but there's action in the sense where real time fighting type of that. So with RPG elements in it, so I think that would be kind of cool. I, know, I think you and I talked about it where yeah. potentially we could uh, have an engine that we use for multiple cartridges that share information on the Atari box. So we'd have one game that you play um, and then pop in the next dungeon and play with your same characters and things like that. So um, I've also had an affinity for sports games I've always wanted to do. Um, I started a hockey game back in 2002. I've always dreamed of doing... Um, um, 
a whole sport um, line of champ sports, TM, um, <laughs> games for the uh, Atari as well. Baseball is one of my favorite sports. Yep. Football, basketball, hockey, of course. So, yeah, um, with your like your Flickr engine, I yeah. think it could be really well done redoing some of the sports games. And I think a ho hockey one would be a really big hit. Exactly, I think so too. Uh, hockey's uh, underrepresented. I mean, ice hockey by Activision is one of my favorite games. Yeah. Um, but that's it shows its age in the sense that you know it's made in 1980. Only a couple. Of two games. on two. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, and of course with the multi port, we could have um, you know more than uh, two of the four players maybe playing. Yeah. Um, but also, oh, yeah. and the Atari box, you'd also have speech for like announcing, uh, and baseball, even you know announcing in, in the hockey as well. So. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if the community would be um, open to um, accepting, you know, oh, yeah. sports games are good, and those are games I loved when I was playing as well uh, when I was younger. Um, but you need generally most enjoyable with more than one person, so um, so they it gets a little a little challenging. So so those are are some of the uh, original ideas I've had. So yeah. um, but like I said, you know, ports. Again, this is just a part-time job for me. So something yeah. like, and I, I call it a job. It's not really a job because a job, you know. In terms of hours, it's yeah. definitely a job. Yeah, exactly. That is for sure. So, um, so just the fact that I have a little time, um, it's nice that when I'm porting game, I know there's an end. And I know what that end is already, so I can plan plan it out. If I do something you know, like a dungeon crawler type game, you know, the sky's the limit. I could be working on it for years, oh, and yeah. and. And there are some people out there that like to, you know, they like that long development cycle. I kind of kid myself in thinking that I'm a developer from the 80s. Like, that's my mindset when I do this, where it's like, yeah. I want to pretend like I have a hard deadline and I'm going to make this as good as I can in the time frame I have, so then I can go make another game. So when I look back on my career, you know, uh, at developing Atari games, I, I won't have just one great game, I'll have 10 really good games. Yeah. And I'd rather do that. I, I think that's more exciting, and it gives you a chance to venture out into different genres, like you know, a scrolling um, game, a maze game like Ladybug, um, you know, a two-player game like Warlord, single screen, yeah. even like a platform game like uh, like Mappy. You know, so those are all different kind of games. So, yeah. so that's uh, and it challenges you to, to exactly. push yourself further to develop these different styles of games. Yeah, exactly. Like I'd never done a scrolling game before before Scramble. So now. That's something I feel comfortable with. I'd never done a platform game before I did uh, Mappy. You know, I'd, I'd done a Wizard of War. It's funny, not funny story, but uh, it's a maze game. And the engine or the code that I used for the, the maze itself comes from Ladybug. And Ladybug originally came from my Wizard of War I started back in 2003. Right. So and that was just a... Uh, like bor borrowed code, you'd be yeah, able to exactly. port it to another game and yeah. then another game. Exactly. Even if it's not exactly the same code, it's the same concept. Like, how am I going to do detection of how you move around the maze or, you know, how you can easily move around the maze instead of getting stuck in corn and stuff like that. All that kind of logic transfers over. So, so it's been interesting. So, Yeah, your, your games have are, are a lot of different genres, like you said. Um, what motivates you to pick the games that you did? Are they your favorites? Are they fan favorites? Are they challenging games to make? Is that how you pick them? Um, generally, the first um, criteria is whether I like the game or whether I played it as a kid. Or it has some kind of sentimental value. Like, for example, Ladybug was my mom's favorite game. So that was a game that... It's, it's actually in the manual, but when you read the uh, dedication I dedicated to her, it was a game that she played. We borrowed, borrowed a friend's ColecoVision. Yep. And she loved it. And she goes, why can't I play this on the Atari? <laughs> And that already stuck with me. So um, yeah. when I got a chance to actually do it, that's, that's, that kind of pushed me to do that one. Yeah. Um, so there's just sentimental reasons. And plus, I liked it as a game anyway. So yeah. that was that. Scramble was one of my all-time favorites. So Scramble itself was actually, uh, um, originally that was supposed to be Cosmic Avenger, which is a game that came out for Coleco. Yeah. And the reason why we even thought about doing that one was because uh, um, when we did Ladybug Collector's Edition, um, Ladybug was advertised by Coleco in, a, in a, one of their uh, catalogs, yeah. and right next to it, so once Nathan Strum, he did a great job on the artwork and stuff of that, and we released that, yeah. um, he goes, well, what about Cosmic Avenger? They advertised that one too, so then we started on it, and then once I got the scrolling engine going, I went, I really don't know Cosmic Avenger that well, so since this is my first scrolling game type, let's do a game I'm really comfortable with. And I went, anyone up for Scramble? And, and that's kind of how Scramble was born. So. Yeah. 
So that was, uh, and of course, those are all very technical. Like Ladybug, a lot of people said, oh, yeah. can't do it because you can't have the asymmetrical maze. I went, well, it can still be Ladybug and, st and be symmetrical. So back then I made the uh, um, concession that, you know, I'm going to move forward and it's going to have a symmetrical maze, but it still plays like a Ladybug. That, that, yeah. ki that kind of leads me to my next question, which is uh, when you do a port of a game, do you, how, how much accuracy do you go for? Do you, like you made concessions with Ladybug. Did you make any concessions with Mappy or Wizard of War? That, um, I mean, there are limitations with, to the 2600 itself, yeah. but how close are you trying to get it to the arcade game or to the original game? Honestly, I'm not a slave for the details to make it exactly like it. A lot of people like that. Hey, you're on level 14. How come he doesn't turn left when he's supposed to turn right? I'm really aiming to make a game that, that's fun, you know, but captures the essence of the game. So that's why I like to do like the little transitions between the game, the exact pauses, so you feel like you're playing the game. Though yeah. That's more important to me than saying, well, this graphic doesn't look exactly like it's supposed to, or the sound's not exactly perfect, or this uh, level, you know, a lot of these games, all these games were Atari uh, arcade games. Yeah. They're meant to be um, quarter um, munchers, right? Yes. Um, but and, and you put in the beginner, the intermediate, yeah. the hard level, so exactly. that so people can. It's not just the arcade experience, so that they can survive more than ten minutes. Yeah, exactly. Or if they're really good at the arcade, they can push themselves. Right. Exactly. So we always try to. Back in the '90s, when I had my, uh, I ran a, I had saw a shareware um, company that I um, was running, Champ Programming. You know, we made games that were ports as well. It seems like I've been doing this my whole life, <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, for that, we always had what was called champ mode. And that was a special mode that was in all of our games where you'd have the arcade version, yeah. but you would in champ mode, it's like Donkey Kong, or Champ Kong, yeah. um, <laughs> and have all new levels. You know, Pac-Man, Champ, you know, Champ pac you know, the champ mode had like all these power-ups of that. So we trying to be creative in that sense as well. So yeah. So we gave, tried to give people everything they want. Something that plays like the arcade, but hey, here's, here's like a, Donkey Kong 2 that you could have played, you know, with some cool and things. So. Yeah. And it, like a trainer level for people who are yeah. just know, don't know the game and don't want to be dismayed yeah, the exactly. first time they play it and, and put it down and never pick it back up yeah, again. Yeah, it's actually funny, it's funny you say that about Wizard of War because, you know, it's obviously a work in progress. Yeah. Um, I never really implemented differences between the skill levels, at least not enough. So I've seen people come up there and they play and all I hear is the death sound over and over again. <laughs> and then they walk away. So, you know, yeah. it would have been nice to have like a novice level where they can go in there. Okay, now I kind of figure out what's going on. I'm not getting killed. I get to level two. I feel like I've accomplished something. And then, then I'll, you know, get harder as you move on. So, yeah. Because you do all ports, or so far, ports of games. Yep. Um, how do you weigh the, the risk factor? I know there, there have been some games that have been pulled from, from Atari Age and other places, like Princess Rescue. Yep. And, what was that uh, made of? No, uh, I don't know, I, I can't, uh, yeah, it's yeah. hard to figure out which one. Yeah. And also, um, the Zippy. Fixer, uh, Zipper's still, Zippy's still uh, for sale, so okay, they're yeah. still pushing it. Uh, Fixer Phoenix Senior. Okay, Phoenix. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Which, yeah, so some of them have been pulled, and um, do you take that into account when thinking of which games you want to port and the risk factor, or are you just like, oh, whatever, I want to do this game? Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a labor of love here. So if a company wants to shut us down because, you know, we've sold, you know, 100 copies of a game and made uh, whatever, yeah. um, then that's really up to them. You know, I do this for myself and uh, for the community. So yeah. if, uh, you know, we're not going to go out looking for trouble so i'm not gonna like right. go do donkey kong or yeah. you know something where nintendo would especially when they're active you know so that's right um, like like you know mappy who's heard of mappies for years and years and years they yeah. just they just haven't used that that ip for a long exactly. time so pretty, the risk yeah. is very fairly low yeah exactly so and but again if they came out and said stop it then we stop it you know yeah. and the rom would always be available out there for people to play and like you said you put in so many hours into these games. You know, you're not making a fortune off of these. No, pretty, no. pretty far they, from they it. Want, so. Exactly. If they want, if they want that chump change. They, they can have it. You know, <laughs> again, it's not. No one, anyone, any home brewer will tell you that you don't do this for the money. It's really about being creative. It's uh, escape for me. It's something that I've always wanted to do. You know, back in the '80s, my dream job was to work for Atari. You know, yeah. so this is kind of a way for me to be able to do that. And um, and so. That's really the reward there. Yeah. And what little money we make, you know, 
gets us out to a Portland game. Yeah, so we basically try to, you know, yeah, exactly. meet with the people that, you know, we really do this for. So it's, yeah. uh, it all, all comes around, so. So you're seemingly one of the fastest programmers yeah. of cartridge-released games. That's true. Um, what is your process of making a game and, and how, how do you get them done so quickly, it seems? Well, it's, this is just, some people are good at some, certain things. This happens to be something I'm very, very good at. So I visualize something in my mind and I can sit down, like for example, like Wizard of War. I had 80% of that done in like three days. And when I say three days, it's like a couple hours each day, just because I have it in my mind. And once I sit down, I can, I can get it going really fast. What really inspires me is like when Nathan, you know, I work with Nathan Strum. Like if he provides to me graphics, you know, we have a very collaborative effort. I've been working with him since 2006. That inspires me. And all of a sudden, it's just like anything. It's like I see one of his sprites, I want to see it moving on the screen. Yeah. So that just that's kind of my um, push to get these games out as fast as, as, as I can. Also, since you know I've made a bunch of these games, I've learned a thing or two over. You know, I have a lot of tools where you know I can uh, take sprites and convert them into the format I need and get them into the game very quick. I have a fairly stable sprite engine, Flickr engine that I've worked years on. You know, um, just the whole layout, like the UI and stuff like that. It's all templated, so I can quickly. You know, Nathan gives me a title screen graphic. I already have the high score logic in there. Bingo, you know, I'm pulling all this stuff in. So that's yeah. important to me where someone can look at a game I made and say, this is definitely a champ game. You see the copyright champ game on the logo, the yeah. controls are the same. Yeah. You know, so a lot of the infrastructure is already in place for me. So I just really just have to focus on, uh, um, you know, just getting the basic gameplay. And most of these games are fairly simple. When you think about them, you know, in terms of gameplay. Exactly, you mean. like getting, exactly. So uh, Mappy is probably the most complicated one I've ever done. Believe it or not, so even just looking at it, I haven't had really time to appreciate it. You know, oh, yeah. it's been a race to the finish to get this thing done. But just looking at it yesterday, going, well, there's a lot to this game. So, Wizard yeah. Board's a little bit more simple, right? It's just a maze. Yeah. I've been able to take code from Ladybug, get that going, right? And my, <laughs> even my brother, your brother exactly. walks in front. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, um, so that one's actually brilliant. And plus, I had started it a long time ago, so I already had a lot of the code. I just had to port it over from my old uh, thing to, to use the new. Uh, um, um, thanks for the scheme. So yeah. that's it. So, um, so that that's probably why I can do these as quickly as I can. And I've been doing this stuff literally for 30 years at this point. You know, so when I see something, I already have a picture in my mind exactly what the code can look like. It's just a matter of how fast I can type it. So, and what uh, what made you settle on the 2600? Is it is it the nostalgia factor? You grew up yeah. with it. It's really just that. Like Mountain Raider, it still sticks in my craw that. Uh, um, uh, You'll prove them wrong. That they rejected it. And I really want, I've talked about doing that last year, is like actually trying to do that. Um, I just need, uh, I think I need a creative team with me that wants to help me bring my idea to something that's playable. But yeah, so um, what was the question again? <laughs> what, what, oh, um, what made you um, settle on the 2600? Oh, 20, yeah. is, is it the capabilities of it as well? Um, because it's kind of an open... Like, is, you can push it as far as you want at 2600. Some things are like, no, this is what you have. Right, exactly. This is all you can do with it. But the 2600, there's still things to be done with it. There's bus stuffing to become come down the line. Yes, and I, so, you know, it's yeah, still but, wide open. Yeah. You can do way more with it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's always changing. Like, if I was still, like, writing, you know, str straight up assembly games like Ladybug, I probably, I got burnt out on that in 2007. It's one of the reasons why I left the scene. Um, I tried, I started Rip Off, I started uh, um, Wizard of War Arcade, I even started Mooncrusher, which no one's even heard of until now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> cats out of the bag. Yeah. I just started all those at once and I just got burnt out on it. Um, so, but then, you know, kind of, uh, like I said, the community breathes new life into this, whether it's through CDF bank switching, you know, the DPC chip, bus stuffing. Uh, I know I've shown you a top secret game that I had been working on with a uh, bus stuffing, coming to a uh, zero page homebrew near you soon um, so yeah so there's there's always that as far as why I do the 2600 games because like a, a lot of us that was my first video game system yeah. and that's the one that pulls out the uh, heartstrings the most for me yeah. so and again that's when I was uh, um, you know 12 13 years old that's the game that I designed Mountain Raider for that's the one I wanted to do for so yeah. so it's always interesting um, 
to be able to uh, kind of fulfill like a childhood dream. It's crazy. That's sure. And, and luckily, there's, there's a huge community as well. I think it's the biggest uh, homebrew community. That's also because there, there's you know just like all of us, we like to have a little pat in the back every so often. So with the 2600, there's such a large community that when you do something like this, you know it's going to be appreciated. Not like I'm going to do like uh, um, I don't want to play any other system yeah. now, but you know just any a, a system that's probably not as popular. You know, Arcadia. Yeah, if you're going to spend all this time, you know, you want to have some kind of, uh, not even even recognition, just know that people are enjoying it, that it's been appreciated. Um, yeah, exactly, Arcadia. Like, yeah. you make a game and four people play. You know, you spend yeah. you know, a year of your life making this game that no one's really going to enjoy. 2600 is such a thriving community. Like you said, once you've made a game for this, you know, you, you see what happens. You know, once the yeah. announcement goes, uh, people... People really get going to a friendly about this kind of stuff, and they get really excited about it. They get behind you, and that's what pushes you over the uh, over the finish line to, to get these things done. Because, yeah. as most people know, making a game, like I said, these prototypes, I can get up running, and you know, like I can get 70% of the game done in in a week. Yeah. And it's the other 51 weeks where you're play testing, you're doing all these options. You know, you're, yeah. um, you know, and even spending the time doing the box. Like Nathan Strum, we almost killed himself trying to get this mappy box, and. <laughs> You know, all the stuff that brings the game all to the end. You know, you really need the community to push you over that because you don't have this, uh, you know, golden egg waiting for you at the end to saying, yeah. "This is why this is your livelihood." It's, it's not our livelihood. You no. know, it's basically just something that you love to do. But just like anything, you need you need something to push you over that. So, so that's why I think I stick with that. I've originally developed games when I was a kid for the 800. Mm. I've always wanted to get back to that, yep. um, and I'm considering maybe venturing off. A little bit to try that because then I could also um, port the game back to the 5200. Yeah, and the 5200, that's kind of the game system after the 2600 where when I saw it in Sears or whatever at a friend's house, it was just like, wow. I know it's gotten a bad rap from some people. I've always thought it's the coolest thing ever. So Well, it's it's a big system exactly. in terms of size. Exactly. So it is impressive. But even like the control, <laughs> just the way it looks over there, it's like a, I've always been enamored with that in the 8 bit um, system. So who knows? It may, may end up going there at some point. So. Um, so probably your your early games on the 2600 um, was more of a, a solo effort or um, a, maybe had a, a little bit of help, but as the games become more and more complex or you're pushing the system further, you've uh, obviously lot, brought in some help with graphics and sound. Yeah. So how, how, uh, how has that been, uh, uh, the collaborations? Has it uh, worked out really well or yeah, does no. it slow things down or does it actually speed them up? It, it's, it definitely speeds things up and definitely makes for a much more quality game. You know, we have some challenging challenges with uh, schedules, you know, like, for example, like I had eye surgery or whatever, you know, so yeah. that knocks us back a couple of days. <laughs> Everyone has things going on. This No one does this for a full-time job. Yeah. Um, I should say in my the early days, you know, the first game I made was Conquest of Mars, which was actually a, yeah. a Caverns of Mars. Originally, I did that for Atari, and that was supposed to be on a flashback, too. Um, right. Unfortunately, the deal fell through. Not for anything I did, although you would think it would have been. <laughs> yeah. um, it was really because they just weren't going to make it anymore, and they ended up going to AT Games. Right. Um, so that's why that was done. That was done all by myself. So I actually, I think I pulled, that's when I first met Nathan, and he helped with a few of the graphics. Okay. When I had to change some of the graphics over so it didn't look exactly like it. Mm. Um, so that's when I first met Nathan. He did all the sprites for Ladybug. Yeah. So we've been working together for 12 years. So, yeah. And Bob... Pac-Man Plus, I'm not going to try to say his last name. Um, he had done the sounds for Ladybug for me. So right. even early on, we had the, a three, a core three teams, you know, graphic sound and programmer. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, now that we move forward, you know, Bob's moved on to 7800 stuff. Um, Mike Haas has uh, taken over the, the range for most of the sounds for my game. The master of sounds. Exactly. He's on everybody's games now. Yeah, exactly. So he's very busy. So but I certainly appreciate all that he does. And, um, and Nathan, like I said, he's... Nathan's the guy I go to at, at first, and I say, here's an idea I have. Yeah. Like, I have an idea, I've started a game, yeah. and I always throw it by him to see what he thinks, and then if he's inspired, he'll send me the sprites, and then we're off and running. Yeah. So that's usually how a game gets started. And then I'll pull in Mike, um, you know, and see if he's interested. He's so busy, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, if he wants to do the sound. So that's usually how, usually how we work there, so. Oh, cool. um, so yeah, so it's, it's a great team, it's a great community. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, Daryl, I can't get to say Daryl Spice. He's, yeah. you know, the work that him and Chris and Fred have done on CDF. He, he helps a lot of yep. programmers with code and cleaning yep. it up and making it more efficient. Exactly. Like, he helped me with the driver for the Mappy because, you know, 
I didn't know how this thing worked, so he, yeah. he gave me the code that they had been using, and uh, I modified it to use for Mappy. So, uh, so that he's obviously been, always been helpful. Tom, TJ, yeah. did not say the last name. <laughs> Yench. Yeah, exactly. He's he's always been. If involved. that's right, I don't even know yeah, if I'm doing. Yeah. Exactly. He's always helped out immensely when you know it comes crunch times. Like there's so many things in Mappy that were not going to fit in there without his help. So anyone that likes a new title screen, anyone that likes you know the little um, bells and whistles in there, you can thank Tom for that because he made the room for him and stuff I had developed and I just had to take out because I didn't have room for it. Yeah. But as he freed up space, I got to put it back in there. So, nice. you know, so on, you know, he's, he's a great guy to talk to. Um, also for Super Cobra Arcade, uh, we would never fit all the levels without him helping. Uh, he came, he presented a compression algorithm to me and, uh, you know, we implemented it together and that's how we were able to put all that stuff in there. So, so it's a great, great, great team. So how has the reception been to like, like you pretty much debuted two games at the same time, Mappy and Wizard of War. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of people obviously at this convention. It's one of the biggest in North America. Mm -hmm. um, how has the reception been? You, you've been hanging around with your games here and playing games with people. Yeah. Uh, what, what do people think of these new games? Um, the reaction and the reception has been overwhelmingly positive. So especially for Mappy, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, a lot of people have a soft spot for Mappy. So, and it's, plus, it's done too. So, um, and it's never been ported to any home system, right. has it? No, not that I know. Maybe it has. Maybe MSX or something like that. One yeah. of those, uh, but none of the the big ones, the big players. So, I think uh, that one has been. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on. People are very, very excited about Wizard of War. It's not complete yet, but you know, a lot of people have very fond memories playing that on the eight bits, the Atari eight bits, and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. So, it's been a little challenging, but I'm glad these are booths are fairly close to each other because yeah, I've been going back and forth talking about um, how this was made, how that was made. And Wizard of War has a lot of extra details to it, the Atari Vox sound and the, the multi-port adapter that we have. Yeah, a lot of firsts, um, yeah, exactly. yeah, which is really exciting uh, for future development of games. Yeah, exactly. And that's uh, another reason why I took on Wizard of War is because it was something new to do. I had never done the Atari Vox sound before or speech. Mike Haas did all the uh, the speech coding for it, but being able to integrate that into the game, it's very exciting. This multi-port, working with Nathan Tolbert, you know? He was here last year with a prototype, um, and I worked with him. Um, his original prototype used both joystick ports. I worked with him, and we came up with a design where I would only use one port. Sorry about that. <laughs> that That's would okay. Do, exactly. You keep hitting my mic. Um, <laughs> um, that only uses one port because I needed the other port for the Atari. A little selfish reason there, but... Well, now, to, to build in the, the voices would have taken up so much room. Yeah. So the Atari Vox is really the only way to yeah. do the voices exactly. and, and get all those in there. And then you only have one port left. So it was like, it, it spurred on. on. Exactly. So as it turned out, we can support four joysticks on one port. So, so Nathan's working on that and we're hoping to have that final design um, and available um, in a few months. So uh, along with the release of a Wizard of War. So we're hoping that that all comes together. So. Um, even without it, obviously, you can still play uh, one player with voice, and you can play two player without voice, um, without the multi-port. So. Yeah. so it's still open for anybody who doesn't have the multiplayer, who doesn't have the Atari box. It's still yep. a totally playable game. Yep, you can do two player without voice, um, just like you could with anyone. So um, so anyway, that multi-port certainly opens up a lot of uh, um, possibilities for future games, you know, um, multi, uh, you know, Maybe I think about a four-player game like Mule or something like that. Port oh, my God. One Mule. of my personal favorites. So. Mine, too, as well. I played the hell out of that back exactly. in the day on the C64. Exactly. So I think that would that would be a good candidate to um, have uh, on the Atari. Um, and also sports games. I know I spoke about those briefly. So it really opens up the uh, possibilities for those. Or even like the uh, dungeon crawler type games. So. Yeah. so speaking of new games, um, is there anything in the pipeline that uh, you would want to reveal? Um, that you uh, may be working on in the future? Um, I don't know. It's, I always, it's not, I'm not trying to keep secrets here. Yeah. I just don't like to get people's hopes up because it's right. just like anything. It's like I need the support of, you know, Nathan and yeah. Mike to get these games done. So if they're not on board, then I can't be on board. Because it's going to be a tough go without their support. Yeah, uh, people wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want to see games that I did the sprites for. <laughs> I mean, I'm not terrible, but there's, you get that professional polish, even the sound. I can do sounds fairly okay, yeah. but Mike just blows me out of the water when it comes to that. Yeah. So that's what really pushes our games um, to, to the next level. So um, 
I probably won't reveal anything right now. So okay, that's probably safe, safe right? Because because exactly. you say it, and then people will be like, "Oh my God, I can't wait!" Yeah, exactly. And then they're just. Well, you said you would make this. Yeah, I'm thinking of maybe putting a poll out on Atari Ages because it's it's good to have people's feedback. Because yeah. again, I like to do it for myself. Um, as long as it's a game that I like, so I only put games I like on the poll anyway. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is for the community. So to do a game that they want is um, want to play, it's it's going to be good, better for everyone. It'll inspire me. It'll inspire them. So it'll inspire you know Nathan and, and Mike to, to get on board. So yeah, that's probably the safest way. I, I know you have a, a bunch that you want to do. Yeah. And just one will rise to the top, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, right now we're shooting to release Wizard of War um, in April. That's why I'm just throwing April out there. We're pretty close to having it done, so I have some new uh, features we want to put in. We actually, uh, I'll reveal now, they're actually uh, um, on the plane ride here. I did some compression algorithms and created up some space. We're going to be putting in a maze editor, which I think will be oh. the first. Yes, form. I remember reading about that. That's yeah. really exciting. Yeah, so that's going to be a first for Atari. And um, so basically. Uh, oh, and it saves to Atari Box, right? Yes, yeah, so if you have an Atari Box, you still be able to edit them without an Atari Box, which, of course, when you turn off your machine, you'll lose your mazes. But there'll be a very intuitive interface where you can put a maze together fairly quickly. Um, so it'll, it's going to come with four new mazes that I'm going to design. Um, so they won't be arcade mazes, and then those four you'll be able to edit. Um, so that's that's what we're planning on doing there. So that's kind of a cool little addition that we're doing there. So yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah. So um, is there anything else you wanted to uh, talk about? Um, uh, no, I just want to probably just say thanks to everyone. Um, sorry, I want to say thanks to you too as well. I mean, you've been very helpful uh, debuting my games on your, on your channel, Zero Page Homebrew. You know, watch that Twitch, Twitch stream. So, um, yeah, so you guys are great. Um, you know, the, just the community, how they embrace our games. Um, without without them, and without the community, I wouldn't be doing this, because it's like anything. You know, I'm not in a room by myself making these games. Aren't I great? You know, the, look at these great games I'm going to play by myself. Half these games I don't even get to play by the time. Unfortunately, yeah. the only thing I regret is that when I put this time into these games, by the time I'm done, I don't want to play them anymore. Yeah. You know, I've analyzed them so much, I can't enjoy them. Yeah. Except, you know, like I played Ladybug the first time in 10 years, and I can finally enjoy it again. <laughs> I love that game. I'm still, oh, that, yeah. that, that's a soft spot in my heart. So, yeah. um, so just a thank you to everyone. Thank you for the community. And, you know, Champ Games is uh, I'm planning on, uh, you know, Wizard of War in April. And yeah. If Portland Gaming Expo, I'm sure it'll be happy next year. We want to have one another game, maybe for sale um, or um, at least demo. very close to demo by then. So um, that's our plans for 2019. So, yeah. well, without uh, you guys making these games, I wouldn't have a show. So exactly, it's so. it's all about this collaboration and community, and it's it's wonderful. The people are playing the games right in the background, playing your game and enjoying them. Exactly. And um, so I want to thank you for uh, doing the interview. Okay, great. And, yeah, okay. thanks a lot. Thanks, James. Okay, so thanks. bye, everyone. Okay. <laughs> my brother Paul. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>